Okay, vino Madonai Elohino Aleinu Maseya Adene Kohen Enan Enan Maseya Adene Koneu. May the words of Torah we learn tonight be for Refuash Lema Fashevach Ben Hatun Hana El Narafana Lo El Narafana Lo El Narafana Lo. Anyone else? Again? Efrat Bat Rachel. Efrat Bat Rachel. Inbal Bat Ilana. The Gam Inbal Bat Ilana. El Narafana Lahen. El Narafana Lahen. El Narafana Lahen. Okay, so. Now that Purim has passed, so we're coming upon the holiday of Pesach. Pesach is three weeks away, just for the ladies not to get too nervous that Pesach is three weeks away. You know, Sukkot, if you think about it as a holiday, that uh, a lot falls on the men. They've got to build Sukkah, they've got to get the Arab Aminim, all that kind of stuff. Pesach is uh, basically, it's a holiday of freedom, but not such freedom for the ladies, unfortunately, yes? Let's begin to understand... Let's begin to understand what does it mean that Pesach is the holiday of freedom. On Passover, what do we say? We say, Yom Herutenu. Right? The time of our freedom. It's very important for us to understand what does this mean, our freedom. Freedom from Egypt. Okay, very nice. Freedom from Egypt. Yes, okay, that's good. So I have a couple of questions. Question number one. We had freedom to love Hashem in Egypt, maybe not as much because we were slaves. But let's look at the laws of Pesach and compare them to the laws of Sukkot. Okay? On Pesach, Halakha says, a person who must eat matzah. Yes, you have to eat matzah. And certainly on the first night, you have to have matzah, as we'll hopefully learn a little later. Sukkot, you also have bread, not matzah, but bread, and it must be in the sukkah on the first night. Yes? Both of those are positive commandments from the Torah. Just first night, Sukkot? First night is the requirement. After that is not Torah obligation, it's rabbinic. Okay? But the obligation from the Torah is the first night. If you're going to eat bread all holiday long, you must eat it in the sukkah. But there's no requirement to eat bread other than the first night, just like on Pesach, with the exception of the fact that we have Yom Tov Shini Shugaliyot, the second day. Right? Mm -hmm. On Pesach, the Torah says we have to have matzah on the first night. If a person wants to have bread the rest of the holiday, it must be matzah. But if a person chooses not to have bread for the rest of the holiday, there's no violation. Yes? There's no requirement for a person to have matzah every single day. If you want to have bread, you have to have matzah. Just like in the sukkah, there's no requirement to have bread every single day of sukkot. If you want to have bread, it has to be in the sukkah. So that's similar. But then when we go to the, the negative commandment, okay? On Pesach, a person who has hametz, which means instead of having matzah, you have hametz. The punishment is? Karet. Karet. Very, very serious. Karet is death from Shamayim. What if a person on Sukkot eats bread outside the Sukkah? Karet? No. No karet. In fact, there's not even lashes for it. There's a positive commandment to eat in the sukkah. You are not doing a positive commandment. There's no lashes for that. So we see a difference right away. And we can make a connection between the two holidays in this way. Now let's look at another way. On Pesach, we have a requirement when the temple is standing to have korban Pesach. To eat one ounce at the end of the meal like the afikoman, that represents the korban Pesach. When do we eat the afikoman? We eat it at the end of the meal. Afikoman is a Greek word. That word means dessert. It's not a Hebrew word. It's a Greek word. It means dessert. So the Pesach, the korban Pesach, was technically the dessert of the meal for Pesach. Korban Pesach, there's only two mitzvot that are from the Torah that are positive commandments, that if a person does not perform the positive commandments, hayav karet. One of them is brit milah. The other one is korban pesach. A person 
who on the 15th of Nisan, the first night of Pesach, is within the confines and environs of Jerusalem, and the temple is standing, and doesn't eat one ounce of meat from the Pesach, <laughs> from the Paschal lamb, Hayav Karet. Most of the time when a person is Hayav Karet, it's from not even doing something you shouldn't do. There are two examples where inaction causes there to be karet. One is brit milah, a Jewish man who goes through his life without a brit milah, is hayav karet, a Jewish man or woman that does not eat an ounce of the pesca lamb, is hayav karet. On Sukkot, there's nothing that, even if you, arba minim, if a person doesn't take arba minim, there's no requirement, there's no karet, so you see the gravity of this punishments on Passover is stronger than any other holiday. The only exception to that would be Yom Kippur. If a person <coughs> eats on Yom Kippur, hayav karet. But other than that, there's no other holiday. On Shavuot, if a person doesn't have bread on Shavuot, he's not hayav karet. So what is it about Passover that we have two things? One is a prohibition of eating chametz, hayav karet, and a requirement to eat the korban Pesach. If a person doesn't do that, hayav karet. Why is Passover so severe? If it's just Yetziat Mitzrayim, Sukkot also represents Yetziat Mitzrayim. Why do we sit in a Sukkot and Sukkot? Leman tedu yedu dorotechem ki ba Sukkot o shafti et bnei Yisrael behotzi otam eretz Yisrael, and therefore you should surely know for all of your generations in Sukkot I put the Jewish people when I took them out of Egypt. So we see that Sukkot is also connected to Yetziat. Mitzrayim. Shavuot is also connected to Yitziat Mitzrayim. In fact, all of the holidays, we say on them, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim, for memory of the leaving of Egypt. Yet, on Shavuot and Sukkot, even though there's this concept of Yitziat Mitzrayim, there is no prohibition on Sukkot or on Shavuot, that violating that prohibition or lack of performance of a positive commandment requires such a severe penalty. Why is Passover unique? So we can't say it's Yat Mitzrayim. Yeah, so? Okay, and Sukkot, he saved us from the rain, he saved us from the heat, he saved us from the cold, he saved us from the goyim, he saved us from all kinds of things. What is the purpose of a Sukkah? Schach, that is shelter, that is protection. Yes? Anyone else? You're free, Davin, you do whatever you want. Pray to God, don't ask nobody. You can do whatever you want? If I was free to do whatever I want, yeah. I can have hametz on Pesach. If I was free to do whatever I want, I could go to work on Pesach. But you have to order something. Say? You have to order to obey God. The... So how's it free? It's freedom to serve Hashem. Freedom to serve Hashem. Okay, that's nice. That's nice. Let's look at the Torah, what it says, okay? Let's look at chapter 32 of Exodus, Shemot, verse number 16. Parashat Kitisa. Okay? Found it? The way you say it, I can never find it. So. Such a temani, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with you? And you're the right one. No, don't be apologize. I have to apologize. Aliyah Sheni. The second Aliyah. 
Pasuk Tet Zayin. Okay, it says over here, it's talking about the Luchot, the tablets. Yes? The Luchot Rishonot, the first Luchot. What does it say? The Haluchot Maase Elohim Hema. And the tablets were the work of God. The Mikhtav, Mikhtav Elohim Hu. Not just the Luchot themselves were the work of God. But the writing in the Luchot is the work of God. Yes? So the Luchot Rishonot have the tablets made by God and have the writing made by God. Now the end of the Pasuk. Harut ala Luchot. Harut ala Luchot. What is Harut ala Luchot? Good engraving. That's what Rashi says. If you look at Rashi, what does Rashi say? Leshon heret. Heret is engraving. The heret ehadhu, which means there's two ways to look at this word. Heret with a taf and heret with a tet means the same thing. It means engraving. Shnehem leshon hikuk. Both of them are the language of engraving. Which means to carve into the tablets. Excuse me. Yes. But Harut is with Tet, not with Tat. So look at Rashi. You don't have Rashi there, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. I have Rashi here. Rashi points out exactly what you're saying. And he says that in Hebrew, the Tet and the Taf here are interchangeable. Which means the same thing. Means Harut. Means Heret. Same thing. Okay, sounds like a tool like freedom. Like Harut. That's not what it says. Okay. It, says it doesn't say Harut. It says Harut. Yeah. Now, that's what Rashi says. But let's see what the Talmud says. First of all, what does it mean when it says Maase Elohim? The work of God, yes? So it says in Avot Derbi Natan, it's a certain segment of not Talmud, it's basically the Midrash, it says. Melamed, this comes to teach. Shaluchot hayu ketuvot, that the luchot were written. U manachot, misheshet yeme breshit. Not like we saw in the Ten Commandments and the Prince of Egypt, that Moshe Rabbeinu went on the mountain and the luchot were carved and made on that day. Avot Rabbi Natan says, what? No. The Luchot were made when? Sheshit Yemei Breshit. Who is it? Avot Rabbi Natan. It's what Midrash. The Luchot, and why does the Midrash say that? What does it mean, Maase Elohim? The creative work of God. When did God finish his creative work? That's right. <laughs> God completed all of his creative work by Yom HaShevi'i. And since the Pasuk over here says that this is the Maaseh, the work, the creative work of God, it must mean that the Luchot were there since Sheshet Yemei Breshit. That God made the Luchot from even before the creation of man. That's the second luchot. That's not the first. That's the second. The first ones were made from Sheshit Yemei Breshit. How do we know that? First of all, Rabbi Natan says that, yes? But how else do we know that? It was the night, it was day, the first day. First day, second day. When it gets to the sixth day, what does it say? And if we look in the Shir Shel Yom that we say in the Tefillah, Hayom Yom Echad, Hayom Yom Sheni, Hayom Yom Shelishi. 
By Friday, what do we say? Hayom yom? Hashishi. Hashishi or Hashishi. Why does the Torah refer to Friday as Hashishi, the sixth, whereas all the other days of the creation are referred to as first, second, third, not the first, not the second? Hashishi means the sixth day. Mm-hmm. Within Hebrew called Hei HaYedi'ah. Yeah. The, the definitive article in English. Don't ask me how to say that in Russian. I have no idea. What is the sixth day? It doesn't say sixth day. Which means it's not talking about Friday. Which is the sixth day, the most important sixth day in the creation of the world? No, that's what happened on the sixth day. But what is the most important event that happened on a sixth day? That's an important event. That's a terrible event. That's a tragedy. When when is Shavuot? What day of the year? What day of the calendar? Fifty days after Pesach. And what is fifty days after Pesach? The sixth of Sivan. Shavuot falls on the sixth of Sivan. Always. Really. Always. Calculate. Count the days. This is the holiday of Matan Torah. When in the beginning it says Yom Hashishi, it's giving us a hint not to Friday, because if it was just Friday, it would say Yom Shishi, like it said for every other day. Why did it say Hashishi? To let you know that everything that had been created from the first day to the sixth day, including man, was all created for Matan Torah, the sixth day. So now we understand what does it mean that the Luchot were made on the first day, six days of creation? Everything in the world was created for the recept, receipt, of the, receipt of the Jewish people of the Torah on Har Sinai on the sixth of Sivan. So far, so good? Uh-huh. But the Torah doesn't tell us what day Shavuot falls on. 50 days. By Pesach, it says, on the 15th day of the first month. By Rosh Hashanah, it says, on the first day of the seventh month. By Yom Kippur, it says, on the 10th day of the seventh month. By Sukkot, it says, on the 15th day of the seventh month. When the Torah talks about Shavuot, it doesn't say on the sixth day of the third month. All it says is, we start with Pesach, the 15th day of the first month. And on the second day of Pesach, Mimachorat, you have to start counting and when you get to 50, you sell. Because 49 days is between the second, first, second day of Pesach and the last day, what we call Sifirat Omer. And then on the day after that, on the 50th day, that is Shavuot, which means the Torah doesn't give us the date on the calendar. Shavuot is a function of Pesach. Why does the Torah do that? Because it's letting you know that there was one purpose for Yitziat Mitzrayim. Receiving the Torah. The Gemara says the Jewish people were taken out of Egypt on condition 
tonight that they would receive the Torah on Har Sinai on the 6th of Sivan. A Jew that does not accept the Torah upon themselves, there was no point in them leaving Egypt. So Cherutenu, the freedom from slavery is on condition. Condition that you subjugate yourself to God by means of the Torah. Subjugate Liot Aved. So far, so good? Very good. Now, let's look at the next thing the Gemara says about this Pasuk. It says the Gemara, Masachet Eruvin. Harut ala luchot. What is harut? Remember, Rashi said carved. Amar Rabbi El Azar. Rabbi El Azar said, My dichtiv, what does it mean when it's written? Harut ala luchot. What does this mean? Harut ala luchot. Il male nishtaberu luchot harisho note. If it wasn't for the fact that the first luchot were broken, lo nishtakeha Torah mi Yisrael. The Torah would never have been forgotten from the Jewish people. Why did the first luchot get broken? Because Moshe got mad soon. Good. First, why did Moshe Rabbeinu get mad? Because there was... Because they made Chet Why did Moshe get so mad? So He saw that they don't deserve it. Based on what we just said so far. They are not ready. They are not ready to receive the Torah. The whole purpose for leaving Egypt was receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai, yes? Just receiving the Torah, putting it in the Aaron and closing the door? No. Receiving the Torah on Har Sinai was not just about getting it, putting it as a trophy on the wall and leaving it there. It's about living the Torah. Which means the condition of leaving Egypt is not just that we receive the Torah. It's that every Jew in all of history lives their life by the Torah. A Jew that does not live their life by the Torah, even though they may have received it, but they put it in the closet and closed the door, and they don't live their life by the Torah, they did not deserve to leave Egypt. On top of that, because they made the sin of the golden calf, Hetayagel, Moshe Rabbeinu broke the luchot, even though Hashem said, Yigasher kochacha sheshibarta, yes, good that you broke them, but because Moshe Rabbeinu broke them, now, unlike before, where the Torah was written on the hearts of the Jewish people, and it would never have been forgotten, that's what Masechet Eruvin is saying, now you're going to have to work for it. It's not going to come easy. Which means, in Egypt, we learned work. We learned how to work as slaves. We were supposed to get the Torah and not have to work for it anymore. But because we made Heta Egel, what we told God is, no, we want to work for it. And now we have to work in order to learn the Torah, fight to stay awake even though it's the 9.30 at night. We have to fight 
so that we can learn the Torah. Because if we're, you know, watching a movie or playing video games, we don't have trouble staying awake. If if you a person was making business right now and making ten thousand dollars, he wouldn't be dozing off. He'd be staying awake the whole time. But when the person starts learning Torah, the Yetzirah comes and starts working on him. Come on, you really want to pay attention to this stuff? Come on, you have a full day of work tomorrow, you have to go to bed. So now it requires work, so you can learn the Torah, and the only way you can live the Torah is you have to learn the Torah. So you have to work to learn it, and you also have to work to do it. That's what the Luchot Shniot represent. The second Luchot, what does it say? Pesol Lecha, what does that mean? Carve for yourself. Moshe Rabbeinu had to carve the Luchot out of the mountains. God still wrote it on the Luchot. But Moshe Rabbeinu had to do the work to carve the mountain. That is the representative of the work that a Jew has to do to study and maintain the learning of the Torah. If the Luchot Rishonot, the first Luchot, would not have been broken... If we would not have made Heta Egel, we would not have to work to learn Torah. This is very similar to the sin of Adam HaRishon. Adam HaRishon, before he sinned, he was able to eat from the Etz HaChaim anytime. He had everything he needed. All he had to do was reach up and he had everything he wanted. After he didn't listen to God and ate from the tree that God told him not to eat from. Now what happens? First God says, you're going to have to work for your food. Not, and women have to suffer to give birth to children. And not only that, but what did God do to the Etzah which is represents the Torah? He made it difficult for Adam to get to it. By putting a sword that was running around, protecting the way to the Etzachayim, which means if you want to get to the Etzachayim, you have to figure out how to get around the sword. That represents the work that a person has to do in order to learn Torah. Charut al luchot. In Masechet Eruvin, the Gemara says something else. Amar Rav Acha Bar Yaakov. Rav Acha, the, Rav, the son of Rav Yaakov, says, Il male nishtabru luchot harishonot. If it wasn't for the fact that the first luchot were broken, lo haita kol uma velashon sholetet be Yisrael. No nation, no country would be able to rule over the Jewish people. Shene'emar, charut al aluchot. Al tikre charut, don't call it charut, which means engraved. Ela herut, which means freedom. Here, what does freedom mean? You are never underneath the nations. They, if you're not underneath them, what does that mean? They are underneath you. Which means all the tzarot that the Jewish people have had in the past 2,500 years were caused by the fact that they did Heta Egel. The freedom that the first Luchot brought was freedom from being enslaved under the nations. When the Mashiach comes, the Rambam says there are three criteria for making a Mashiach, the person who's Mashiach to be Mashiach. Criteria number one, he has to gather the Jewish people together in the land of Israel. Criteria number two, he has to build the Bet HaMikdash. Criteria number three, the enslavement of the nations. Which means the Mashiach comes to fix this mistake. 
When the Mashiach comes, the Jewish people are not going to be underneath anyone. There's a reason why when the Jewish people lived with the Christians, we were treated as second-class citizens. There's a reason why when the Jewish people lived underneath the Muslims, they were treated as dimmies. Why? Because we were the Heta Egel and the first Luchot were broken. When the Mashiach comes and the Jews take their position, then what's going to happen at that point? The nations are going to recognize that they inherited lies from their fathers and they're going to come to a Jew and they're going to say, I recognize that my father taught me lies. Please teach me the way to get to God because I know that you guys know it. That's Mashiach. So freedom represents freedom from enslavement unto the nations. The Gemara says something else. This is in Pirkei Avot. Charut ala luchot. Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, Mai dichtiv charut ala luchot. What does this mean when it says charut ala luchot? Al tikra charut ela cherut. Don't call it charut, call it freedom. Cherut. Lefi she'en ben chorin ela ze she'osek ba Torah. Who is truly free? Someone who is, what does osek mean? What does the word osek mean? Walking, like walk. Toil, in English, the more proper translation of osek, it doesn't say is toil, which means effort. Steiging, very good. Wow, you learned that word, very good. Steiging, as they say in Yiddish. Yiddish, steiging. So when a person is steiging, when a person is osek Torah, then that person is truly free. When a person is not osek Torah, he is not free. What is he avid to? What is he avid to? Come be, come on, deeper than that. He's avid to the Yetzirah. He's an he's a slave to his desires. If a person studies Torah, the Torah comes to teach you. It's not about what you want. It's not about what you desire. It's about what God desires. When a person makes his ratzon into the ratzon of Hashem, God gives him everything he needs. This is the message of Pesach. The message of Pesach is that we we subjugate, we enslave ourselves, not to Paro, not to the Goyim. We enslave ourselves to Hashem through the Torah. And when we do that, that's when we are free. Unlike in the Hatikva. It says in the Hatikva. Liot am chov shi be'artzenu. What is meant by the tzionim, the non-religious, non-Torah Jews? What is chov shi? Chov shi means I don't have to toil. I do what I want. We have a country. It's a Jewish country. It's a Jewish state. I can do what I want. I can walk naked in the street. I can sleep with who I want. I can eat what I want. I can worship what I want. No one is going to tell me what to do. That's called chofshi, free. 
That is not the Torah's concept of Chofshi. What we just learned right now, even though Pesach has this wonderful idea of freedom, it's not like the freedom that is thought about in the Hatikva, and it's also not like the freedom that we learn about in America. This is a free country. What does that mean, it's a free country? As long as I'm not hurting anybody, I can do whatever I want. This is not the Torah. This is not the message of Pesach. The message of Pesach is, we are free to do what God wants. A person who doesn't understand that, Hayav Karet. A person who doesn't appreciate the only reason God passed over your house was so that 50 days later you could fulfill the world's purpose, which is to receive the Torah and Har Sinai and to live the Torah on Har Sinai and afterwards. That's represented by Korban Pesach. A person who doesn't appreciate that the only reason God passed over your house and slew the Egyptians was not because you were so great. We worshipped Abu Dazara just like the Egyptians worshipped Abu Dazara. The difference is we had Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And the difference is because of what they did, that gave us the purpose that we would come out of Egypt and go to Mount Sinai and receive the Torah. The zuchut, what's the purpose? It's the zuchut and also the work that they did. Mm -hmm. The toil that they did, God made lots of promises to them and kept very few of them. <laughs> Hametz! What does Hametz represent? Why on Pesach, if a person eats hametz, hayav karet? Why so severe? I can have bread right now. There's hametz right here. I can eat this right now. Baruch Hashem, I'm good. I eat this four weeks from now. Karet! Why? What does it represent on the Pesach? Good. It represents three things. Kina, ta'ava, ga'ava. All those three things, jealousy, desire, arrogance. Those three things are the tahbulot of the yetzer hara. That's how the yetzer hara comes to a person and tricks you into messing up. Make you lachmitz. Lachmitz to. Uh, spoil. Not spoil. Yes, that. Ferment in English. Not ferment. What is lachmitz? Become vinegar? No, not become vinegar. What is lachmitz? Is You had an opportunity, but mm -hmm. lachmitz died. You missed You missed the opportunity. Right. Right. To let to to let time to be lazy to time go by to take it easy so you miss the time. But let's think about that. Like you had an opportunity to, to, to do the right thing and you went and did the right the wrong thing. Why should eating hametz on Pesach require such a severe punishment? We said the Torah is how a person is truly free. <coughs> the Torah teaches you that it's not about your desire, it's not about your jealousy, it's not about your arrogance, you and who you are, it's all about God. When a person understands this, then he's free, then he deserves to leave Egypt. If a person doesn't understand that and becomes a slave to the Yetzirah, 
through the kina, through the ta'ava, through the ga'ava, then he didn't deserve to leave Egypt. What happened to the Jews that didn't deserve to leave Egypt? In the Choshech. They died in the Choshech. And that's why the Hametz is so severe. Because it represents a person who is a slave to the Yetzahara. Rather than a person that's a slave to Hashem by following the Torah. And that's why Pesach is so strict. A person who eats on Pesach Hametz that is mixed. We don't allow Hametz to even be mixed in Shishim. Generally, if I have Hazir and a piece of treif meat, Hazir, pig, gets mixed up with other meat and the other meat is 60 times the Hazir, what does that mean? It's kosher, it's batel b'shishim. On Pesach, if Hametz mixes with something that is not Hametz, the whole thing is not kosher, even if it's then a thousandth. Why? Because of the stringency of Pesach. Because a person who doesn't understand why God gave us that freedom was better off not leaving Egypt. Okay? Now that being said, let's see if we can begin to understand a little bit about some of the halachot of Pesach. Okay? It says in the Rambam, in the laws of Hametzu Matzah, first perak. Kol ha'ochel, look how he starts the laws of Pesach. Kol ha'ochel kazait hametz bePesach, mitchilat lel hamisha asar, ad sof yom ehad ve'esim benisan, Bemezid Hayav Karet. Any person, man or woman, who eats an ounce, kazayit, which is one ounce, of chametz in volume, one ounce of volume, of chametz on Passover, from the beginning of the night of the 15th, until the 21st of Nisan, which is seven days, because in the Torah, Pesach is seven days. If he did it purposely, mezid, hayav, karet. Shene'emar, as the Pasuk says, ki chol, ki kol, ochel hametz, venichreta. Whoever eats hametz is cut off. It's like you're handing in your Jewish identification card. Karet is basically the person either doesn't live till the age of 60. That's why there's a halakha that's there, or a custom that people do when they become 60 years old. You're okay. They throw a party. Oh, really? Yes, we don't have a party every year. This is not a Jewish idea. The idea of having a birthday party is not Jewish. It's Gentile. Gentile. How do we know it's Gentile? There's only one source of a birthday in the Tanakh. What is the only source of a person celebrating a birthday in the Tanakh? Very good. Paro! When did he free the Sar HaMashkim and kill the Sar HaOfim? Yom who led that dead paro, which means the Torah is telling us birthday celebration. This is not Jewish. It's not Jewish. Why is it not Jewish? Party for another year living? Of course, you'd be a Jew. Why is it not Jewish? Why is that not a Jewish concept to have a party on your birthday? I'm not saying it's not allowed. I'm saying it's not a Jewish concept. Why not? It's like you're celebrating that you know. You did nothing. I'm a year older. You did nothing. You don't do everything. And when you turn 60, then you're allowed to have a party. Why? Because you survived, you didn't get karet. Yes? What's another example where we see a birthday and how do we treat that? 
So the Goyim birthday is a celebration. It's exciting, they drink, they eat, they do stupid things, yes. What's another example of a birthday and how the Jewish people deal with that birthday? Not a birthday of a person. The birthday of the world. When is the birthday of the world? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. And on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish people throw a party because the world is now 5,779 years old? No, Rosh Hashanah is not party. Rosh Hashanah is Yom Adin. Rosh Hashanah is a very serious day. So a person's birthday is a very serious day. It's not a day for a party. It's a day for self-inspection. The day the world was born. Born Harat? Harat. You become pregnant. You're pregnant, you're Harat. Very good. So the world became pregnant with Adam. Man was created on that day. Even though the world was created from the first day, the creation of man is the purpose of the world. And why is the creation of man the purpose of the world? Because man has to follow the Torah. Animals don't follow the Torah. So the entire purpose of creation was for man, created on the sixth day. For what purpose? For the sixth day, which is Har Sinai, which is accepting the Torah. What did I say before that? Nobody's bothered this poor guy. So the birthday is a time for self-reflection, a time for analysis, a time to look over the past year and see how you behaved. Rosh Hashanah is precisely that. A birthday would be precisely that. Gentiles celebrate New Year's very different than Jews celebrate New Year's. They get drunk, they do stupid things, they go wait on Times Square when it's freezing outside. Okay? Why? Because they're trying to run away from the fact that they're a year older. So they're giving themselves anesthesia. Because a year older is a year closer to death. A Jew says, I have a mission. My mission is to follow the word of God. How did I do this past year? How am I going to do better next year? Because the goal of a Jew is to follow the word of God. The goal of a Jew is to follow the Torah. And therefore, a birthday is a time for self-reflection. Getting back to Pesach. What about if a person is shogeg? What is shogeg? What mistake? How is it mistaken? When you didn't know. I forgot it was Pesach. I picked up a piece of bread. Oh my God, I forgot it's Pesach. And I ate it. I didn't do that purposely. I would never have eaten bread on Pesach. That's a separate issue. We're going to get to that in a second. Very good. We're going to talk about that. But let's just say there's bread. You go to work. There are Gentiles around. There's a piece of kosher bread over there. And you pick up a piece and eat it. That's not your bread. It belongs to the Gentile. When you take it in your hand, it's your bread. So that's shogeg. That's not karet. What does a person bring when a person makes a mistake in an area of the halakha that if he did it purposely he would be killed or get karet. Hayav korban hatat kevu'ah. He has to bring korban hatat, a sin offering. Just like if a person is mehalel shabbat shogeg, what is the punishment if a person is mehalel shabbat mezid? Death. Skila, if there's witnesses, yes? Karet, if there's no witnesses. If a person violates the Shabbat, he forgets it's Shabbat, or he forgets that this is not allowed on Shabbat, he has to bring korban chatat. This is the formula throughout the entire Torah. Any mitzvah that you have to do, that if you, a prohibition, 
that if you do it purposely, the person would get either death penalty or karet. If you do it by mistake, you have to bring korban chatat. What's another way a person can be over on Pesach by Shogeg? He forgot it's Pesach or he didn't realize that this is Hametz. He picked up a glass of vodka. He thought the vodka, and vodka whether it's made from potatoes or vodka whether it's made from wheat looks exactly the same. The same color. Yes, Russians are experts on vodka. Yes, same color. Any difference? If it's potato vodka, it might taste a little different, but potato vodka and wheat vodka looks exactly the same. So if I pick up a potato vodka, is that a violation of Pesach? Absolutely not. If I pick myself up a French vodka that's made from French wheat, that is, I have got it. What happened was he had a glass. He thought it was potato vodka. And he realized afterwards he drank it, it was wheat vodka. That's shug egg. And then the halacha continues, Echad ha'ochel, whether the person eats it, Echad ha'memache or what does he do? He takes the hametz, he crumples it up, puts it in water and drinks it. Why? Because the pasuk says, Ochel hametz. A person shouldn't think to themselves that if they drink hametz, it's okay. The Torah said, Ki ochel hametz. Here, the Torah, the language of Achila, doesn't mean just eating. It means consuming by way of the mouth, so it goes to the back of the throat and you have benefit. That is called Achila. That is the Torah's definition of Achila. If I take Hametz and I rub it on my skin, and it gets absorbed into my skin. No, no. That is not eating chametz. Why? Because even though it was absorbed into my body, it didn't go derechapeh. It didn't go by way of the mouth. But it says also Moshe Votechem. So, what is Moshe Votechem? You're not supposed to have it even around the house. Okay, it's not your chametz. It's someone else's chametz. You took a cream. There was a cream on the table. It wasn't belong to you, it belongs to somebody else. You decided to rub your hands with it, and then afterwards you look at the cream and you see it's made out of hametz. Is this a violation of Pesach? No. No, you did not. Even though it was absorbed into your body, it's not called achila. But it says not to have in your... We're going to get to well, that. Why do we even learn that if you're not supposed to have that? Going... Because even though it's not in your house, it's possible when you go out to work, it might be there. But what can it be out of Hamas that you put on your body? Oh, that's what, what you know. There are creams that are made like that. You didn't know, but, but now yeah. you, you yeah. really like... Now, if, soap, now, now remember, hold on, hold on, let's not get crazy. One, one thing at a time. Let's just read what it says here and then we'll, we'll develop, okay? Because the Rambam, he, the way he presents the information... It is perfect. Right. One thing at a time. And if you do it the way he does it, there's very few questions. Okay? There's a group of people that make a huge mistake regarding the definition of Achila. And they hear of the uh, J witnesses. Yeah. What do they do? They will not take a blood transfusion. They won't take a blood transfusion, even if it means the blood transfusion can save their lives. Really? Really? Damn it. Why don't they take a... If you ask them, excuse me, you don't take a blood transfusion, why not? Because they say it says in Leviticus, Al tochilu kol dam. Do not eat blood. And of course, they're ignorant to the ways of the Torah. They don't understand when the Torah says eat, it means by way of the mouth to the throat. Jew is not allowed to take blood and drink it. That is a prohibition. Depending on what's karet or lashes, depends on where the blood came from. Right. 
But they interpret the word achila to being absorbed into the body. So if I take a needle, put it into your vein, and put blood in there, they call that achila. Stupid. Even, even if a person died, they don't do it, right? Even if a person, they have to die rather than take the transfusion. Okay, they're stupid. They don't know. They didn't get a tradition. Ah, we inherited lives from our fathers. Yes, that's what the that's what it says. That's the first halacha that Rambam brings regarding Pesach. Now he continues on. He says, Hachametz be Pesach asur be Hanaya. Hanaya means pleasure. How do we know that Pesach, you're not, allowed, you're not allowed to have benefit from chametz? Physical benefit, either monetary or physical benefit. How do we know that? Shene'emah, lo ye'achel chametz. What is lo ye'achel chametz? What is ye'achel? Cannot be caused to be eaten. Lo ye'bo heter achila. There should not be any situation where you have the ability to eat it. So from here we learn that a Jew, man or woman, is not allowed to have chametz in their possession on Pesach. The hamaniach chametz birushuto Pesach, and a person who allows there to be chametz in his place where he is, on Pesach, in the place that's his. Afal pi even though he didn't eat it. Over bishne lavin, he is violating two lo in the Torah. Shene emar, the Pasuk says, Lo yerae lecha seor bechol givulecha. You shall not see for yourself any seor. What is seor? What is seor? Don't look at modern Hebrew. Modern Hebrew would translate seor as yeast. Mm -hmm. Yeast is not seor. Yeast is a fungus. What is seor? In the good old days, how did they make bread? Separate what? The, the the... They would take wheat, mm -hmm. they would take water, they would mix it together, and they leave it there for a couple of days like that. That is called in English mother dough. Then, it's Mahmetzet. And then what they would do, and that dough is not edible practically. Mm -hmm disgusting. When you want to make yourself bread, then you take flour, water, mix it together, and then you take a piece of the mother dough and you mix it in with the dough that you have there. Let it sit for a couple of hours and then you put it in the oven. That mother dough is called seor. You shall not have any seor in any of your dwelling places. The Ne'emar also says, the Torah says, it's too loving. Seor lo You shall not have any seor to be found in your house. We see we have two lavin. The isura chametz, the isura seor, shebo machmitzin echadu. And the prohibition of chametz. And the prohibition of Seor is basically the same. So why does the Torah differentiate between Hametz and between Seor? Because Hametz is edible. Seor is not edible. What is it? It's a mother dough. It's still a food. It's not a shampoo. It's food, but it's food that is not edible for a human being. And that is not allowed, chametz. 
That's se'or and chamek, two separate things. But they're both the same prohibition, not allowed to have it on Pesach. You're not allowed to eat it, we've learned that. And you're also not allowed to have it in your possession. And a person who leaves chametz in his possession is over from two lavin, as the Rambam just said. Any questions? Well, when you sell it uh, to the goy, it's okay, no? We're going to get to that. It's not in your possession. If you sell it to the goy, it's not in your possession, right? So then you don't own it. It has to be a real sale, though. It can't be like a, you know, a fake sale. Let's just do one more. Okay? And then we'll stop. <coughs> Seder? We just said there's two lavim, two negative commandments, yes? Generally, a negative commandment, what's the punishment if a person violates a negative commandment most of the time? Lashes! You're not allowed to have hazir, as we're going to learn in next week's parasha, yes? If a Jew takes an ounce of hazir and eats it, he gets 39 lashes. Because it's a lota said, it's a prohibition in the Torah, and you violated that prohibition you get 39 lashes. What if a person doesn't remove the chametz from their house on Pesach, which means they don't eat it, but they have a nice piece of bread sitting there all holiday long. Cut it. Can't be cut it, you didn't eat it. It's, said, in your it's in your possession. So the Rambam says there's two lavim, two prohibitions. So you would think to yourself, that means you get 39 times two lashes, yes? No, let's look at this now. A person does not get lashes for maintaining hametz in their house because of lo yera'eh, which means it should not be seen. Lo yimatzeh should not be found. Unless kana hametz bepesach o himetzo, which means he went to the store he bought Hametz on Pesach, and now it's in his possession. Then he gets 39 lashes times two. Wait, if he didn't buy it. Wait, wait. Or if he had something that wasn't Hametz, and he caused it to become Hametz, then he gets 39 lashes. But if he had a piece of bread that was sitting in his house before the holiday, and he did not destroy that bread, he didn't remove the bread, he doesn't get 39 lashes. What's the difference? Then why are we cleaning for Pesach? Okay. Well, anything at a time. What's the difference? Why is it that if you buy chametz, or if you make something become chametz, then you get lashes, but if you just left it there, you don't get lashes? Because in order to get lashes from the Torah, you have to do an action. No, it's not purpose. Both of them could be purpose. I left that chametz there because I want to see it all holiday long. I did it purposely. But the difference is leaving the chametz there is not an action. So no punishment for me. I didn't say it's no punishment. I said no lashes. So what's punishment for me? But right now we have to understand what does the Torah say? The Torah doesn't say clean your house. It's That's not what the Torah says. The Torah says don't eat chametz, don't drink chametz, and by the way, don't have any of it in your house. Well, That's it. let's put it this way. If all year long you decide you don't want to eat chametz, you don't have any chametz in your house, you have to clean for Pesach? Yeah. No. I don't have any chametz. Some kind of action you have to do. No. Then we have to like fight. Where, 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 where did it get to that? But as far as cleaning the house is concerned, you don't have to clean your house. Why? Because the house is clean. Let's say I go to a house once a year on Pesach. I have a house. I have a house in Florida, let's say. And once a year, I go with my entire family on Pesach. And I never, I'm not there all year long. And no one else lives there all year long. And that house has never had chametz in it. I can show up there. I don't have to clean anything. No, you don't. My sister might be coming bring something. Yeah, mice, no. I, 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 mouse free. No, we don't have to worry about mice. Okay, let's finish up. So it says over here, why? Why do you not get lashes for the first case, but you get lashes for the other two cases? If you bought it and took it into your possession, 
or if you made chametz, because in both of those situations, you did an action. In order to get punished with lashes for a lo you have to do action. A person who violates a lo through inaction is not punished by lashes. Okay? Good. Let's continue on. We'll finish with Dalek, huh? <coughs> Aval. But. Im hayalo chametz kodem pesach If he had chametz before Pesach. Uba Pesach. And Pesach came. Velo bi'aro. And he did not destroy it. Ela hinni ho birushuto. He left it in his possession, which means he didn't destroy the chametz that he had in his possession before Pesach. Even though he violated two lotas in the Torah, he doesn't get lashes from the Torah. Because he did not do an action. He left it there, but there's no action in doing that. Umakin oto makat mardut. But he doesn't have punishment from the Torah, but the rabbis give him lashes. These are not Torah lashes. These are rabbinical lashes. What's the difference between Torah lashes and rabbinical lashes? It's not divine because the one giving you the lashes is a man. What's the difference between lashes given by the Torah, required by the Torah, and lashes given by the Chachamim? Oh no, lashes by the Chachamim are physical. Physical? So one is checked by the doctor, the other one doesn't? No. Mm. The Torah lashes... Arba'im yakenu lo yosif. Forty, really thirty-nine. No more. Unless he does two lavim. If he does two, then he gets thirty-nine times two. But for one lav, you get thirty-nine lashes. That's the limit. No more. Rabbinical lashes can be given until one of two things happen. The person says, He'll never do it again. Mm-hmm. Or he dies from the lashes. Oh my God. So we see rabbinical lashes are worse than Torah lashes. Well, they just keep continuing, even if he's dying? They keep continuing hitting him until he says he's going to follow what the rabbis say. And they stop. Once he says that, and they think he means it, they stop. Why can't you stop, say before they start hitting you? Um, it's not the way it works. <laughs> okay, so that's called makat madut, which is lashes of rebellion. So we see rabbinical sometimes is worse than Torah violation. Okay, any questions on that? No, no but I have a question about Pesach. Sure. Uh, so if I travel now to Israel and I have my the, I leave all the chametz in the house, is it allowed? Do I have to clean the house before I leave? Are you going to come back to the house on Pesach? No. no. Your chametz should all be put away. So and you have to sell it. You have to put sell. it away. It should be put away, and you sell the chametz because it can't be. Even if it's not, you can't see it. It's still in your possession. It's your house. So yes. I could put take everything away, put it in one cabin. Yes. And sell it. And sell the chametz. Okay. Okay, you have to, because otherwise, even if you're away, it's still your chametz. Yes. So you have to make sure that it's not in your possession mm-hmm. okay. or in your reshut. The house, your own home, is your reshut. It's not my reshut. I can't come in anytime I want, right? But you know what? Whenever you say like selling it and all that, every time you know, I have to do it. Maybe before even I haven't done it. Sorry, but but now that let's say I do it. It sounds to me so fake, <laughs> so fake that like, okay, I call the, the rabbi, I said to him, okay, buy it for me, or he sells it, or it sounds to me like, you know, like, sketchy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let's understand this, okay? Yes, it's like, you know. Let's understand this. <laughs> the Torah 
is very, very sensitive to Jewish monetary loss. Very sensitive to Jewish monetary loss. While the Torah requires you to give charity and things like that, it doesn't want you to lose money if you don't have to. Now, a person might have chametz that's worth two, three hundred dollars. He might have a business that he has thousands and thousands of dollars worth of chametz in his possession. Mm-hmm. Ideally, he should take all that chametz and destroy it. Mm-hmm. Or sell it before. You said you don't like the selling part. Ideally, he should take all the chametz in his possession, including the $150 bottle of sco- dollar bottle of scotch, wow. mm-hmm. and should put it in a bonfire and destroy it all. I see. The problem with that is most people are going to have a very hard time doing that. So the Chachamim said, okay, we're going to work this, and this is a true sale, meaning the way it works is like this. Just because of that? You have all your chametz. Mm-hmm. Now, what's, throw garbage, get rid of garbage, things that are spoiled, that are not, you know, yes, you throw yes, that up. Yes. But this chametz that is going to be very valuable, you know, you're not going to want to burn that, destroy that, get rid of it. So what you do is you make someone your shaliach. You're not selling it to the rabbi because the rabbi can't own your chametz just like you can't own your chametz. No. Right? So you're not selling it to the rabbi. The rabbi is not buying your chametz. That's the last thing the rabbi wants yeah. is to give himself more chametz for Pesach. He doesn't want that. <laughs> he's a shaliach. He's a shaliach to sell your chametz. He's not taking possession of your chametz. He's a shaliach to sell, a messenger to sell your chametz. So what does he do? He goes to a guy and says, I have five million dollars worth of chametz. And it has to be a legitimate amount. Let's say he's selling it for a whole community. Mm-hmm. Presumably there could be five million. Everybody's got five, ten thousand. Mm-hmm. Add that up. I have a million dollars worth of chametz. I would like to sell it to you. The guy says, I'd love to buy it. I don't have a million dollars right now. So the rabbi says, okay, give me a deposit. Give me a deposit. And the deposit will now, you will take ownership of all the chametz. And you need to pay me the rest of the money in full by the day after Pesach, that night. You know, an hour or two hours after Pesach is done. So the guy gives the rabbi a money to purchase the chametz. It's a 100% legitimate sale. You have to tell the guy everywhere the chametz is. And technically, he has the right on Passover to knock on your door, knock on your door and say, by the way, I would like my chametz, please. And then you let him come into your house and he takes the chametz and leaves because it belongs to him. It's not yours. Mm -hmm. At the end of Passover, the rabbi meets with the guy. And the rabbi says, No, Jose, you gave me 10 bucks. You owe me 9,999,990 dollars. Give me the money. Jose says, I don't have the money. So the rabbi says, okay, the sale is canceled. But during the entire time of Pesach, the goy owned the chametz. So it's a legitimate sale. If the goy wants it, he can come to your house and you have to, and he has to take it. You can't give it, you can take it. Well, there was once a situation where a goy wanted to, uh, wanted to, uh, give them money, and they had to give them all the chametz. So you have to be careful. Okay? Let's say you have a $300 bottle of scotch. Mm-hmm. You've got to make sure that whatever money you're asking for the goy is comparable to all the chametz that you have. So if you have a scotch collection, let's say, you have 50 bottles of scotch, mm-hmm. each one worth $300. That's 
$15,000. You better put on that paper, Scotch Collection, $15,000. Because the guy is going to have to pay you for that. If you don't do that, he can give you whatever it is and takes it. And there was a situation once, one of the Gentiles, I think this is in Israel, they got smart to this idea, and they said they want to buy it. So if they paid it, then the Jews have to give all the hamas to the guy because it belongs to him. But they buy it, the guy doesn't want to give it back. What do you mean doesn't want to give it back? If he doesn't pay, if he didn't pay okay. it basically automatically reverts back to the owner because the seat did not fulfill the terms of the sale. So if he, unless he comes up with the balance, the chametz reverts back to ownership. Okay? And that's how, so you have two choices. Choice number one, destroy all your chametz. Don't sell any. Destroy it all. Choice number two is destroy some of it to fulfill the mitzvah. And the other chametz, we sell to the goy. Yeah. If you want to be machmir, you know, in the old days, you know, in, in our ancestors, they used to have cabinets full of food and all that. First of all, they had only what they needed for that. In Teman, yes. there weren't too many Jews that owned the $300 bottle of scotch. Yes, yes. They yes. had enough food to last them for the couple of days. Couple that's days. It, that's it. So at the end of the day, there was no sale <laughs> because they didn't have anything to food? sell. That's what I'm saying. All right, we're living in Amarika. Amarika. So we're living in America. Baruch Hashem, we have, right? So if you don't have, you have nothing to sell. Yeah. So you're right. In Temanim, they didn't sell chametz. There was nothing to sell. What are they going to sell? Like the, the, the dust chametz on the ground? What are they going to sell? So that's, you know, so that's why, you know, everybody according to, and the, but it's not that they can't, now that a Temanit is living in America and she has chametz, that doesn't mean that she can't sell it. It just means that you, Baruch Hashem, you've done better than your grandparents did in living in Teman. Yes? Okay, any questions? Okay, Baruch Adonai, Lama, Amen, Amen.